Okay, we're live. Hello, Facebook land. Um, I am Allison of Ends and Stems, and I'm here with Aubrey Terrazas, who's a sommelier and works at Palette Club as well. She's the buyer. Mm -hmm. So if you saw our last video, which we will link later, Ends and Stems is a meal planning service to help um, make it easier to choose what meals to cook each week and also grocery shop. And Palette Club is a perfect combination because they are a wine club that helps you blind taste to learn your palate so you don't get caught up with choosing a bottle of wine by its cover, but mm -hmm. also reduces that sort of moment where you're like, you need some wine, but there's a million options here and it can be really mm -hmm. stressful and people end up choosing wines that they dislike. So um, we are live here, so I can take your comments, which would be just really fun to hear what you have to say. I do these videos and I talk to nobody all the time. So um, any questions, um, you can post them and, um, and we'll answer them. But um, we're doing a recipe tasting and wine pairing. Yay. Yay, let's do it. Um, and also what's so cool, I mean, this year has been so hard for everybody. We're in, you know, quarantine. And on one hand, like I definitely miss regular life and just casually going out to see people. But the upside for me has been really connecting with people around the world. It doesn't matter. You could be like my friend down the street, but I'm in California. Aubrey's in France. And yeah. it's like the same. It's... I, I just think it is a very cool bonus that this has become really normal and it makes the world feel very connected. I enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. It's nice that people have kind of broken down the wall, that it's okay to like make friends and connect online. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify, I'm, I'm definitely not French. So ask your questions in English, please. Yeah. <laughs> in France. <laughs> but, yeah. So, um, we started this with, I did the palette club tasting, which everybody should do. It's seriously, it's super fun. Um, they mail you a little box with four, you could do reds or whites with four half bottles. I was kind of expecting like a tiny taste and was so surprised to get full, like half bottles yeah. and they're all covered up in tissue paper with a little number on them. So you blindly open them up and you taste them and you just, react and you can do it at home you can do it with guests you can do however you want to do it um and then you go on their app that coordinates with it and you rate it and after you rate four i think it tells you kind of gives you this little profile of what you like and then and then you can subscribe to the actual wine club and they'll mail you full bottles of wine like you would with a regular club and the more you taste the more refined your um, recommendation and profile becomes and then they keep updating it and mailing you wine based on what you like and what you want to try and how adventurous you are. It's, it's not only smart, it's really fun. Like I enjoy it very much. Why do you think so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We started with the blind tasting to prevent bias because a lot of times people have bias based on how pretty the label is, or they think that they like w w one wine or they don't like another wine. Uh, so it's been really interesting and surprising to see what people like. And, but I also found that with the blind tasting, it makes it a lot more interactive of an experience because it just yep. opens up your curiosity. And I think, you know, socially, whether you're doing it online or with your friends and family at home, um, it just opens up conversation. Yeah, it is really fun. I My husband one time brought home some kind of Greek wine. I can't even remember what varietal mm -hmm. it was. And it was terrible. I did not like it at all. And then I had in my mind, I don't like any Greek wines. But I was surprised in my profile, there was one, I still can't remember the name of it. It was something I hadn't heard that actually rated really highly for me. Um, and I would have not expected that, so. Yeah, I think it was um, Zeno Marvro. Oh, which makes perfect sense because I saw on your profile that you tend to like kind of darker fruits and sort of this mm -hmm. blend, not blend, but um, because that's a confusing word in wine, but yes. somewhere in between sort of this European and American style where it has some ripe fruit, but it also has a lot of those savory elements mm -hmm. like wild herbs and mineral and all of that, which makes sense because yeah. you're a chef. So. It was really cool. So we um, chose a wine. Aubrey chose this wine and this came in my, um, the things like reverse them. 
Yeah. <laughs> mirror image. <laughs> Don't let me. Uh, okay. So um, this is the wine. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Um, I haven't tasted it yet. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, but based on Aubrey's suggestions and discussing this last week, I did put together a recipe and we've actually cooked it. So now we're going to taste the wine and actually compare it to the recipe. Yeah. Um, so it's Givado Labette uh, Cote de Rhone. Uh, Givaudon. And it is a Cote de Rhone. Uh, it does have a little bit more Syrah. Cote de Rhone tends to be predominantly Grenache and is often blended with Syrah, Mouved, and some other stuff. Um, and so these wines are, the wines from this area do tend to be kind of a little bit more full body uh, with, yeah, it looks beautiful, <laughs> uh, with lots of savory herbs and tobacco. And again, kind of that mix of like ripe and tart fruit. Um, and it's really fun. So we talked about the pairings because these wines uh, can be really fun with, um, again, kind of the, those like gamey elements. So if it's not gamey meat, then having like a char, I can tell you like it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> wild herbs. Um, and, uh, and we also talked about vegetables as well, kind of that more green vegetal element to complement those the savory herbs that are on the aroma of the wine. It's really good. This is exactly the type of wine I love. Like this is, it just, but if I could have one type, it would be like, this is really, really good. Wonderful. It works. I'm terrible at talking about um, why I like the taste of wines um, or describing it. I remember in culinary school, I, we actually had like a wine tasting segment and a couple of classes. And there was one guy who would, he would try to be so serious about it. And he was describing a wine that tasted like a parking lot in autumn which mm. I kind of understand what he was talking about, but we just lost it. I mean, the, <laughs> almost everyone was young, immature. Like we were, you know, not experienced at tasting wine. And I, I do know what he means, but also just, it can be really silly, but I'm actually okay with it as long as we're having fun about it. But um, I have not really become all that much better about talking about why I like wine, but this is not sweet. Um, it definitely, um, it's not even really fruity. Yeah, I, I think that um, they have they have you know a fruit aroma in it, but it's not it's not like that really candied fruit you find sometimes right. in California. It's more like a wild fruit, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, and it has like a really um, like a deep kind of aftertaste. It gets like a little bit tangy at the end, but it's still yeah. like a really dark taste. It which I'm super excited about because when we talked about this and when we looked this up, it said it would go with things that are grilled or charred or kind of have that to go with it. Yeah. So in my dish that I put together, um, I did a stuffed pepper and let's see if you can see, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to make sure to char the pepper um, to get bring in some of that flavor as well. So when I was writing a recipe to go along with it, I really wanted to do something vegetarian for a couple reasons. Um, one of the most commonly asked questions I get are for more vegetarian recipes. But importantly, it's because most of my clients actually eat meat. So mm -hmm. I feel like vegetarians know where to find recipes and they don't tend to ask for as much help with vegetarian recipes. But people who eat some meat but want to maybe try to be vegetarian a couple times a week, feel like they're the ones who speak up and ask for guidance. So it ends up being consistently, like I, I think we're over a year running, it's the most um, highly searched term on my website is vegetarian recipes. Okay. Whenever I do an event, people ask for that. And then from an environmental point of view, I eat meat, I probably always will, but the idea of eating just a little bit less meat is mm -hmm. one of the most impactful things you can do as a consumer of food um, for the planet. And it does not have to be that you're going fully vegetarian, you can still incorporate meat responsibly into oh. you know, an eco-conscious diet, but it's not needing it for every single meal. And I think especially in the United States, the way we use meat is like, you know, this giant slab with then a little bit of side dishes. It's not great for our health, it's not great for the planet. So to be able to learn um, more vegetarian or vegetable forward dishes 
is something that um, I love putting recipes like this together. And you'll see in this recipe, I did a full mushroom version. I had this beautiful trumpet mushroom that I laid across mm. the top. Um, I did say you could add ground lamb, you could add ground turkey. And I, I actually did add, so this is perfect. interesting, I added, for, and it's perfect because actually my first two meals of the day were vegetarian, um, but perfect. then I added, <laughs> yeah, I added um, some lamb sausage not perfect. sliding in the sauce, but mm. perfect. Yeah, yeah. So you can add a little bit and that would be a great example of a dish that is very vegetable heavy. We have multiple, multiple vegetables packed into the pepper um, and then in the pepper itself, but then adding in a little bit of meat in that way would be just a perfect way to do it. Um, so, and then what was really interesting to me, did you end up doing a green pepper? We had talked about green versus yeah. red. Mm -hmm. um, green bell peppers, um, they're classic for stuffing, but I don't eat them a lot. They're not actually my yeah. favorite bell peppers for really anything else. Um, but to pick up that char and, and to stuff, it looks really beautiful. And specifically for the pairing notes, it was green bell pepper that went mm -hmm. with this wine rather than the red. Is that because of sweetness you think, or what's the, what's the story behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the bell pepper that you sometimes smell in wine, um, it so the the smells that you get in wine, it's because they have the same sort of flavor compounds that you find in the vegetable or flower or whatever. Um, and so I think we talked about this on the first video and that smell, that green bell pepper smell is the purazines. And none of these grapes are really highly purazinic, but um, it really does change depending on the place and how ripe it is and other factors. Like Bordeaux reds often have a really s strong roasted red bell pepper. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's just the different aromas that are in the grapes. That's really cool. Um, and for me, there's not like a super, super strong bell pepper aroma in this wine, or I'm not drinking the same wine as you, but in these wines, the, the mm -hmm. Rhone wines, um, you can find it more in like Cab Franc. Mm -hmm. But um, I think all of those like, green aromas play off really nicely mm -hmm. from the green mm -hmm. bell pepper because it is it is different i mean that's why you have a preference right right now. right <laughs> yeah and then the other thing i picked up on that i was excited to incorporate was the dijon kind of flavor which i vaguely remember like dijon is obviously french as well and how um the foods from a region typically go with the wines from a region because the idea of like why things taste like they do is because of where they're produced and how they're grown and you know the actual makeup of the soil but then also even the sensibilities yeah. of putting things together so i loved that piece i also really like dijon and we did in the sauce we did like this creamy dijon sauce which is really really good and easy to make and it's it makes it like eh, let's see if you can see the color so i did a combination of uh you can't see it there you go i did a combination and it's really thick now because it got cold but um of smooth dijon and whole grain dijon because i love the look of the whole grain i think it but you could do a smooth sauce too if you wanted to um, do that. But I think this was a really easy dish. I'm going to cut it now. This was a really easy dish that I think is nice enough to serve for a dinner party. Um, you could make them all in advance, which is the saddest thing to me is like serving guests at a dinner party and then you're stuck in the kitchen and yeah. you don't feel like you can participate. But this could be done even the day before and then you just pop them in the oven when everybody gets there or you're ready to eat and it's it's seriously no work. So this is my go-to sort of serving for other people. I'm gonna eat this on the internet. Right here. Let's see. Let's see a little better now. Yummy. It's really good. The Dijon, there's no Dijon in the filling. Mm. So you just get it in the sauce. And then I would even consider doing this on the barbecue as well. That's yeah, great. we, we don't have this. The oven I didn't turn mine on. Yeah, so but that's why I did it on the broiler. And then you saw the other one, but then this is just stuffed. This is sort of the casual family way I would do it. It's a little bit easier to cut the peppers um, through the center and lay them on their sides. They're easier to stuff that way. They sit nicely, and it makes kind of a nice portion. If you were going to serve a side dish with this, I would cut them like stand it up and down and cut it lengthwise. But then the big tall one where you cut off the top part, you know, and stuff them, it makes for a bigger portion um, 
and they look really nice, but you could kind of go either way. It doesn't really matter too much. But I did do this one because this is actually how I would make it for my family, sort of very non-fussy. It's just easy to stuff. Um, but you could also do it on the grill, which would bring some of that. I mean, it's actually just a good tip in general for um, cooking vegetables if you're a meat eater who's not sure about eating a vegetarian meal, mm -hmm. that like feeling of putting it on the grill really brings the um, that umami meatiness to vegetables. And almost all vegetables can be grilled and taste amazing on the grill. One of my favorite things to grill is green beans, actually. They are, mm -hmm. you have to be a little bit careful that you don't lose all the green beans to the grill gods, I but. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think I also remember you saying that you chose the char on the vegetable because a lot of vegetarians, because we all think like red wine and meat, but then, you know, if right. you're a vegetarian or just trying to eat more vegetables in general, it can be hard to find a good pairing for red wine. Right. And I can also say, you know, from my experience as a psalm, that the majority of people prefer red wines over white. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, I mean, I don't know if you tried it together yeah. yet, but it's, it's great together. Yeah. It tastes really the good. The red wine is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm, yeah. Cheers. Um, I do. I do think it tastes great, actually. Um, and it's still before noon, so I'm not going to polish off my bottle of wine, but I am going to eat the pepper for lunch <laughs> and then come back to the wine maybe later. Um, but um, so one of my big questions, and even as a professional chef who is not a um, professional sommelier by any stretch, is if I get a bottle, what how can I start to find a recipe that might go with it? And, you know, honestly, like for, for a weeknight meal or let's say even just a casual Friday, but you know, I want to have a at home date night with my husband and we want to have wine and I want to make something, but it's still, you know, so it doesn't need to be perfect, but I'd like to be on the right track at least. What are yeah. some things I can do when I just am like looking at my wine rack and now I have all these great wine choices? How can I start to figure out what to cook with it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I do think uh, the first thing is that wine pairings don't have to be fussy. I think a lot of times when people think of wine pairings, it's like all in or not. You know, it has to be this extravagant thing that I intentionally prepared together. Um, but I, I mean, it's helpful to know a few different things, like those tricks about like the grill matching with red wine. Mm -hmm. um, so that way you can start to kind of open up in your mind a little bit when you're trying to be creative with the pairings. Uh, another good thing, so there's two ways to approach pairings. The first one is um, kind of the what goes together grows together thing. So that's like mm -hmm. if generally like if you're drinking a wine from France, like maybe you can look to see what types, not necessarily like make a full on French dish, but you know, right. incorporating that Dijon or other ingredients they'd use. Um, but even more than that, you can kind of look at the aromas in the wine and say like, okay, like I smell, it's kind of, even if you don't have the full lingo yet, which is fine. Like, yeah. okay, it kind of smells vegetal and like herbaceous. So maybe a green bell pepper would be great. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. You know, this wine is uh, very fruity, like a Zinfandel. So, you know, maybe something with like a fruit sauce and a little black pepper would be great. Um, the other side of it is opposite pairings. And so if you know that you're gonna make a dish that's very um, strong, you wanna make sure the wine doesn't overpower it and more balances it. So like spicy food is great with something with a little sweetness to it. Um, or if it's, uh, you know, same thing with like a very, a very sour dish. You wouldn't necessarily want like a really like tannic wine. Yeah. I think actually sour feels like one of the hardest ones yeah. um, for pairing. I think I, I always feel like, you know, like um, maybe Thai food or Vietnamese food when you have a lot of like really limey sauces, yeah. which I love. I Those are the ones where I'm never really like, I really need some wine with this. I struggle with those the most, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I often like a lot of white wines with mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. but definitely kind of on the air of more, um, not that sweet. I think people are really intimidated by the word sweet, but sometimes yeah. there's just like that little tiny kiss of sweetness, just a few grams, mm -hmm. like something like a Vouvray or an off dry mm -hmm. Riesling from the Mosul is great with sour. Yeah. Um, then, oh, I just had one other great question. I thought it was a good question, but now I've totally forgotten it. Um, 
That's what happens when you drink before noon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All bets are off. Um, <laughs> one problem um, I have is somebody who likes wine a lot. I drink wine, you know, every week, but I rarely get the same bottle again. And I always feel like, like if I've now tasted this, maybe my pairing was, maybe it was great. Maybe I had some ideas for what I would do next time, but I find that I never buy the same bottle again. Um, and I noticed also you're not, like you said, you're not drinking the same bottle as me, but you're drinking like a similar region. Yeah. Um, do you think that's common? People don't, people of like my level of wine knowledge don't often drink the same thing or do they just get the same bottle every time? I see a little bit of both. I think a lot of people stay in their comfort zone because mm -hmm. they find something they like. And I mean, I think we've all had the experience of buying a bottle of wine, which is not cheap, even if, you know, even like 15, 20 bucks, right. like, it, you know, it's just down the drain. Right. Um, so I, I mean, that's, that's one thing that we try to do is help you find different wines that you know, you're going to like. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, definitely sticking within the same region can be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And again, kind of learning a little bit of the, the lingo, mm -hmm. um, like saying like, okay, I like wines that are savory and full bodied, not too mm -hmm. high acid, like this wine. Yeah. And then you talk to your local wine shop, yep. uh, which I say with a small note, because I think a boutique wine shop, they'll usually be really knowledgeable. If you're going into a grocery store, then I would say you're kind of on your own. Right. Um, Right. But you know, the same region is going to be pretty similar. Like if yeah. there are some producer variations and all of that, but mm -hmm. um, you know, in the Rhone, the wines are going to be similar. Yeah. You're going to find other producers that you like, but it's going to be a safer place to experiment than yep. um, just trying just a whole randomly. new area. Yeah. Okay. How about let's, let's put this myth to rest forever or let's hear your opinion. I don't finish this bottle of wine today. Mm -hmm. What do I do with it? How can I preserve it for tomorrow? Sure. Um, okay. Well, so first, for really big wines, actually, sometimes they're great. They're better the day before. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> the day before. <laughs> yeah. Better the day after. Okay. Yeah. Some, some, not always, but like for example, okay. the one that I chose. Um, I. It's not exactly Cote de Rhone, but it's from the Valley of the Rhone. It's a Gigandas, okay. so it's a village in the Cote de Rhone. Okay. Um, and I knew, I've had this wine before, it's a really big wine, and I actually meant to open it up last night, but I opened it up at like 11 a.m. my time, and it's about seven right now. Okay. So I knew that it needed more time. Um, but if that's not the case, generally, it depends on the wine. Um, we do have a blog post about this, but like one to three days is a pretty safe bet. Mm -hmm. Um. And then out, the pumps don't really work that well. Mm -hmm. They actually kind of take the aromatics out of it. Um, and there are some products, Corvan and Repor are both really good. Corvan is um, a needle that extracts it out of the cork. Repor oh, okay. is a stopper that pulls oxygen out of it. Okay. Um, those, are both, those are both really great uh, and they both work really well. Um, it reports out ten. I've heard. I've heard that you just can recork it and put it in the refrigerator. What do you think about that? Uh, it helps a little bit. Um, and refrigerator with the pump is better than nothing. Okay. Um, but it's still. It's about like I would say that it helps it like by a day mm -hmm. or so. Um, but generally, the best thing to do is try to. If you know that you're the type of person that doesn't finish a bottle, it's better to invest in a wine preservation system. Yep. And you don't have the pressure either. Like the other day, it was my birthday this weekend. And yep. so I was in, and I'm a wine person, so I was in the mood for different wines throughout the day. Yeah. Um, and, but I'm not going to drink like three bottles of wine in a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was like, okay, you yeah. know, I want this orange wine with lunch, but I want champagne later. Right. Um, and so I could really just have like a half glass of something and then not feel bad about saving it for later this week. Right. Um, right. So, I mean, that, but yeah, I usually like, plot yeah. it. Um, I'm right. like, okay, if, if I'm drinking it by myself, like maybe my husband's out or whatever, or it's, you know, post COVID, he's the only one I see back in the day, we could just invite somebody over and have them help me drink yeah. it. But, but now it's like just me and kids. Yeah. Um, I just always make sure that I'll drink it the next day. Like if I only have one night and no, for whatever reason, I'm not yeah. going to want any wine tomorrow. I just won't open it but it sounds like if i got one of those systems 
then I, that second day might actually be okay. It would give me a little mm -hmm. more flexibility. Um, yeah, definitely. And I mean, um, you know, I'm not to um, digress too much, but I, I do think that it's affordable too. And yeah, nice to drink bad wine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, and then the the last thing would be if it's really left over, um, I, I mean, a white wine or red wine sauce, you can use wine in cooking. You know, if I kind of get down to the end or even honestly, if I have a wine that um, I really just don't like, like you said, it's too short yeah. to drink it. And I'm like, I just don't want to drink this. I'm certainly not going to make myself do it. But I do find then that for cooking, um, the flavor of it isn't as clear, you know, you can kind yeah. of balance it out with other things. So some of my favorite go to's are, you know, like a red wine braised chicken or beef or something like that. If you have just a little bit, even just like yeah. half a glass, you can make a red wine reduction sauce, with a little bit of shallot, black pepper, and then put some butter mm -hmm. and stock in there at the end. And then that's amazing on, you know, poured over glazed vegetables, or, you know, you could do your, um, like a cauliflower steak, you could do a big roasted mushroom, mm -hmm. but you could also do that over like a pan seared chicken breast. That's a super great go-to. And it really is, you know, when you have this much left, right. that happens to us sometimes too, where like we have this much left and like, I'm not going to want yeah. that much wine tomorrow. So right. I might use that for cooking. Um, and then right. with white wine, you know, risotto is a shoe in I've made that with so many different white wines and you really just need some of the sweet and tanginess it, and it almost doesn't matter. Like if somebody said, make me your best risotto, I might not just take any old wine, but in terms of not wasting what you've already opened, if it's just kind of a regular night and you're making the dish just for you, you can really use any. And even red wine risotto is a thing, which is really cool as well. And that's especially good with mushrooms or eggplants or like other vegetables kind of roasted up into it. So that's always my next go to afterwards. So rarely does any wine get so wasted that, you know, it goes down the drain. There's always a way to cook with it yeah. afterwards. And I'll, I'll also say um, when I was a wine director at like Michelin starred restaurants, we we're closed um, Mondays and Tuesdays. And so on Sunday, we'd have all these wines open. So especially like if you like had some friends over and you have mm -hmm. a lot of bottles with a little bit left, Honestly, like you can mix them all together and make sangria. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's an awesome idea. I, I add um, some fruit and you can be, you don't have to be specific about the fruit, like citrus for sure. And maybe like apples and pears. I add a little bit of gin to mine and yep. some rosemary. Um, Ooh, I love the rosemary. Yeah. So that's, I mean, you can get creative with it. Just like with cooking, you kind of, kind of spice it up with whatever you have around, but you can totally use older wine for sangria because mm -hmm. you're putting all that other crap in it anyway. And that's a really good way to also just, that's if you don't want to eat it and if you still want to drink it, that's the way to use it but, um, when it's not as fresh. That's an awesome idea. I've never thought of that. I, I feel like I have had sangria, but I'm, it's not like my go-to. I've never mm -hmm. ever thought to do that. Um, I really love that. I'm going to, now I'm going to have to try that on purpose, I think, but, <laughs> um, so, okay. Any, this was super fun. I feel like we could talk yeah. all day and someday as much fun as this is online, we'll do this in person, but, um, um, well, I'm from San Francisco, so I'll be back. Perfect. Um, we will put some links below. I'll put the recipe linked below and we'll share that. Um, I'm going to share it on my newsletter and yours, but everybody should definitely try ends and stems for meal planning and definitely try palette club to do the wine tasting. It's really, really fun. Um, and you'll get great wines that you like afterwards. And it's, I mean, what's more exciting than the UPS guy coming and being like box of wine <laughs> and you know, you're going to like them all. I mean, it's, it's 2021 and we're still in a pandemic to some extent. Mm -hmm. You deserve that, I think. Oh, we're totally in pandemic in France. We have a six year yeah. So this oh, is wow. exciting as my week is going to get. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing yeah. this and um, we'll see you online and um, everybody grab all the good links and stuff below. Yeah. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Happy birthday. Bye. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Good night. Bye.